Science is a competitive field, just like literally every other field ever, where you have a finite amount of money or resources being divided by an amount of people greater than one. They will compete for more resources. Yes, okay, I know there's predator satiation, and that's how many crops actually work to actually uh, distribute their seeds if they can manage a long enough period between seed dispersals for the predator population to die down, but we can save that for later. Bamboo does this, for example. So do cicadas that operate on a 13 or 17 year cycle. Well, yeah, okay, we can talk about that at some other point. <clears throat> yes, science is publish or perish often, which basically means you either publish results and attract more funding or you go broke. Uh, yeah, this is as per spotted in fiction. So scientific teams are very competitive, fine. But the lone mad scientist archetype does not apply. You need teams usually to make major discoveries in, well, relatively modern times. Yeah, okay, Sir Isaac Newton figured his stuff out on his own, but even he had to build on others' work to some degree, such as, oh, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, we usually attribute this to Sir Isaac Newton. Yep, yep, sure. Uh, when did Sir Isaac Newton live? Oh, rather after 1159, right? <laughs> so, the original attribution was noted by John of Salisbury. He attributed the metaphor of dwarves standing on the shoulders of giants to Bernard of Chartres, Chartres who uh, died sometime after 1124. Bernard of Chartres was a French guy, which means John of Salisbury, English, citing him. Well, actually, for most of the Middle Ages, uh, England and France were not so rivalrous. Sure, we had the hundreds of years war and all that, but that was a little bit after this point. Okay, a couple centuries after this point, England's population at the time was uh, just not within shouting distance of France. So really it was France versus Austria for most of Europe's medieval history. Well, France versus the Holy Roman Empire, but Austria was generally the emperor, so yeah. <clears throat> now, checking others' claims uh, or racing to publish a research question, well, this is of course very common. After all, if you are first in, firstest with the mostest, you have a huge advantage in winning further funding and fame and any prize money involved, of course. Checking others' claims? Well, if you catch your rival out on a lie, or, well, somebody who pays you's rival out on a lie, hmm, you can see where this is going. Uh, but if you have one person trying to race against a team, sure, teamwork, if you have two people working on a pr single project and compare that to the progress of two people working independently, well, there are two factors. One is that inevitably somebody uh, is a little more lax when working together than if they were solely responsible. Like responsibility does matter. But if you have two people working independently, on separate projects, that's when your respons personal responsibility uh, kicks in. If they're working separately but on the same project, then you end up reinventing the wheel a lot. So you do a lot of repeated labor. 
I mean, sure, even then you might be able to find some nuance or other that the other side didn't find. But ultimately, you're going to repeat a lot of the work. So a team will generally manage to run over all over a single person trying to compete with them. Now, if you have multiple teams competing and it, it feels like they're repeating a lot of the same work and they don't hate each other too much or otherwise have too many problems with each other, they may get tired of the rat race, especially if they happen to be using the same model organisms and doing the same experiments. So they might decide to just cooperate and say instead of, oh, you do 10 trials of that and I'll do 10 trials of the same thing and we each do our own things, it might be, oh, you do five trials, I do five trials, and we pull our information together. Now, model organisms are easy to grow in the lab and well suited to the type of question being investigated. Common ones include these. Uh, I'm pretty sure the rat race is pretty obvious. It's ratus. Yeah, this is the typical lab rat. Rat. Well, actually, uh, it's the fancy rat. <clears throat> but when the fancy rat is being used for labs, yeah, it's a lab rat. Same species, and subspecies too. Mus musculus is the mouse. Lab mice. I'm pretty sure we are all reasonably familiar with the idea of lab mice and lab rats. Since they are mammals, placental mammals at that, they have reasonably similar uh, physiological reactions compared to humans. For the most part, it's really difficult though to perform a cesarean section on a rat or a mouse because, well, they just are too small and they tend to bleed out. They don't have enough damage reserve. Much like a larger ship of the same design generation will take longer to sink generally than a smaller ship assuming no critical damage such as an exploding magazine. It just has more reserve buoyancy. So it gives you more time to potentially fix things up. Arabidopsis saliana is mustard. Uh, it's been bred into many, many domestic vegetables, which we'll discuss later. E. coli, Escherichia coli, pronunciations of which may vary somewhat. Well, that's uh, a bacterium. which is very common in feces, human feces to be specific. So E. coli has many, many, many lineages, some of which are pathogenic, others of which are opportunistic, and others of which are, well, symbiotic with humans. Oh wait, no, we shouldn't say that. We should say mutualistic. As we will see uh, some chapters later, symbiosis just means living together. They might be commensal, so one side benefits and the other side is not harmed, or they might be even predatory. That's still living together. Hmm. C. elegans, Cener habditis elegans, uh, pronunciations of which may vary again. This is a nematode. Drosophila melanogaster, that's a fruit fly. Some of these terms like nematode may not be immediately familiar, but it's a type of round worm, which we will discuss later. Uh, the only one that might take a couple moments for somebody who's used to biology even to recognize is Daniel Rario, 
which is the zebrafish. Now there are many uh, fun stories we can share about lab animals. Uh, for example, according to their own accounts gathered together, uh, Beijing University students sometime in the 80s and early 90s-ish, well, okay, mainly the 80s and 70s, uh, they found that after they did their immunology experiments on lab rats or lab mice, uh, bo boiled mouse is actually pretty nice to eat, supposedly. Now, I haven't tried it, but it makes sense. Uh, you aren't actually supposed to consume lab organisms, like, ever. Okay, maybe if you're uh, breeding them to be uh, your new crop or new livestock strains, sure. Yeah, in those cases, you might want to actually try consuming the things because while just analyzing their chemical composition does not tell you as much as you sometimes might want to know before you try introducing them to, well, consumers. Now, if you have different perspectives on the research team, such as a biologist who focuses on ecosystems, one who focuses on cell biology and so on, this can be very useful for noticing different aspects and details of a problem. Now, all this talk of diversity is very common in Western research institutes in the present day. So, some philosophers of science say that science is so influenced by culture and politics that it's not more objective than other ways of understanding nature. Hold on a second. If you aren't going to understand nature by doing experiments and trying to draw the best conclusions you can, which is well, what science is, or at least to test if your uh, ideas are wrong, what are you going to do? Blind guessing? Well, uh, the other extreme is that people think scientific theories are natural laws, i.e. this is how reality works. Uh, no, unless you're claiming that your understanding of your observations is actually perfect. No, this is not how reality works, period. No, this is well, we take what information we can, we do the best interpretation we can, and we say that we think this is a good approximation of how reality works. So neither extreme position is correct. The balance as to whether the culture and politics influence is actually causing problems, that varies by region. For example, in some places, it's considered sexist, i.e. discriminatory based on sex. A biological sex doesn't exist according to some people <coughs> in some places. Anyway, it's considered sexist to say that a person who is 206 centimeters tall or about 6 foot 9 or taller is more likely to be male than female. And researchers in these places will be persecuted for making such statements. Well, <clears throat> you uh, may also have heard other people taking issue with science by saying that science is all about theories. Excuse me, sir, but your everyday use of theory is what science calls a hypothesis, i.e. a guess at what is happening. A theory in science is a conclusion drawn from many, many observations that come to the conclusion that, oh, this is about the best understanding we have as to how this works. For example, the theory of evolution is based on innumerable observations and supported by all evidence we have to date. To disprove a theory, you need to go pretty far, usually. 
or to even attempt to disprove a theory. Now, science is theoretical. That means it makes discoveries and hypotheses. And by trying to prove or disprove those hypotheses, by the way, you can't really prove a hypothesis. Uh, you can only really disprove it. And hypothesizing that invisible pixies are making your flashlight not work. Yeah, there are some things you can't prove or disprove using scientific means. So, science makes discoveries. Technology makes inventions, because technology is a matter of applying information you get from science. We usually lump them together because information that is not used is usually considered pretty useless by most cultures. This is very reasonable, but there is the issue of, hey, maybe we can use this later. Or maybe we can use this in some other field. Uh, and the connections are not immediately obvious. So scientific research has value just on its own. Now society has to adapt to both discoveries and inventions, such as, say, after discovering the structure of DNA, uh, society went and made the invention of DNA sequencing. And then what? Remember, scientists are also part of society. So they invented DNA sequencing, and then they applied this to forensics, to analyzing the ancestry of creatures by uh, comparing the number of mutations. Because, well, usually if you have more mutations, more time has elapsed if this region is not under selection, this region of DNA. We'll discuss that, the words being used a, a little later. It's really difficult to predict the breadth or speed of effects of new theories or applications. For example, after the invention of high-speed railroads in the 1960s uh, and their deployment in Japan and France, it took quite a long time for others to decide to invest in them. This is dependent on the needs, wants, and cultural or social environments of various populations. So the speed of effect, well, that varied a lot depending on the needs of various populations. The breadth I, how wide it spread it is? Well, back in 2008, China's high-speed rail network was practically non-existent. But now, all the major cities are connected. And I mean major by Chinese standards, okay? Like, even second-tier cities in China have, like, Paris's population. <laughs> so, uh, no, not all of those are quite hooked up yet, but they will be in the near future as of this filming right now. Now, high-speed rail is very suitable for China, Japan, and much of Western Europe due to the population densities and the well-developed, in the case of Western Europe, uh, transit networks. If you have a well-developed transit network, such as subways, or streetcars, or trams, terminology may vary, uh, you will be able to move huge amounts of people. For example, a subway can generally move on the order of 60,000 people per direction per hour. Whereas a light rail network generally moves something like 30,000 people per direction per hour. This is a whole lot more than you can move by bus. Like, imagine if you had to funnel those 60,000 people uh, on buses, let alone cars, uh, along the road on top of where the subway is running. 60,000 people per direction per hour? Um, that's 1,000 people per direction per minute. 
1,000 cars passing each minute. Hey, how long is a car? I mean, assuming it's one person per car, the safe car length is, or the distance, is probably about 5 meters. Okay, let's use 5 meters for basically a Fermi estimate, i.e. nearest order of magnitude. Okay, that would have us saying 10, but 5 meters, okay. So, 1,000 people. That's 5 kilometers worth of cars. If, it, if it's a one lane. It's 1,000 people per direction per minute, so a two lane road was one lane in each direction. That's a thousand cars in one minute, so five kilometers in one minute. That's 300 kilometers per hour that these cars have to be driving at. Well, um, good luck with that. <clears throat> and if you have three lanes per side, you have still cars spaced five meters front to front, which is like ridiculously close, uh, still moving at 100 kilometers per hour. Yeah, something tells me your traffic is going to be jammed at way lower a speed than that because most drivers are not, in fact, suicidal. So, <clears throat> if you have a good metro network, so tr good transit systems, then high-speed rail is very suitable for you because you can have the existing transit network connect to the high-speed rail station and move huge amounts of people per hour to and from the station if need be. High-speed rail is much, much higher capacity than airlines. And, well, it's also way more efficient in terms of pollution. It's way less carbon dioxide per kilometer traveled. It can be powered by renewable sources such as hydroelectricity, wind turbines, nuclear power. Well, nuclear power isn't renewable, but it's way higher energy density. And it also doesn't produce greenhouse gas. And nuclear waste, well, it doesn't actually migrate much when locked up in soil. So it's relatively easy to dispose of as compared to airliners, which must rely on fossil fuels. Now, high-speed rail is great when you have enough population density and enough of a transit network to allow for it to operate efficiently. But if your population density is low, and your suburbs are really spread out, such as in the United States, then no. You will end up having to make too many stops, and that's not even counting the not in my backyard syndrome, i.e. Uh, property rights that are much harder to appropriate land from. Now, for India, well, high-speed rail would make sense because it has about the same population density as China, but there is a few problems here. India, the travel network is, well, yeah, it's okay. It's not terrible compared to some places, but it's not quite up to the job of supporting high-speed rail stations and feeding them and re with enough people and removing enough people quickly enough. What else is a problem in India? Oh, I'll put quite simply, India is not as rich as China on average and well, there's no current demand for high-speed rail in India compared to China. Yes, there are plenty of people who would like high-speed rail in India, but the number of people who can actually afford the tickets... Hmm. Now, to be fair, when China first started building its high-speed rail network, there weren't that many Chinese people who could, who could afford the tickets either. What did they do? Well, 
The land near the stations grew rapidly in value. The Chinese government took measures to keep the prices down and to reduce price gouging. And well, the increasing prosperity of the country made an increasingly large number of people capable of taking it, at least occasionally. The Spring Festival, so Chinese New Year, uh, the migration of people at that time is the largest migration of humans on the planet. And it happens every year. You aren't going to be able to move that many millions, hundreds of millions of people by airliner. At least not over the span of a few weeks. Whereas railways, you can do this. Buses wouldn't work. Cars, um, well, first of all, a lot of Chinese people can't afford cars. Second, have fun with those traffic jams. No. <laughs> okay. So in the U.S., there are certain conurbations where urban areas are merged together. In these places, yeah, high-speed rail could make sense, but you'd need a pretty good transit network to feed the rail terminals and to remove people from the rail terminals. Otherwise, well, the U.S. car culture is particularly strong, so is U.S. airline culture. These conurbations include Cascadia, i.e. the West Coast. Even the West Coast is a little dubious. Uh, because the gap from Portland in Oregon down to San Francisco is a little bit big. Now in the U.S., because of the need to get people to vote for you, to get elected again, uh, politicians will generally end up designing rail systems that are... Uh, a little bit stop ridden. In other words, because of the lack of a good public transit network, people don't want to live too far away from a rail station if they want to actually use a rail station. Well, the result is that the trains don't actually get up to speed very easily. In the northeast of the US, you also have a conurbation where you can have high speed rail. But acquiring the land needed to build high-speed rail, which needs to be pretty straight, and the way the property rights litigations work in the U.S., i.e. lawyer heaven, uh, uh, good luck with that. Nope. Uh, another possible area in North America where you can potentially have high-speed rail that's reasonably pr profitable is from Quebec City, through Montreal, through Toronto, through Detroit, to Chicago. The Great Lakes conurbation, or megalopolis, is a potential area you can have high-speed rail in North America. Everywhere else, well, the population density is just too low. And besides, if you're going to be crossing from the east coast to the west coast of North America, where on the west coast you can go from Vancouver down for high-speed rail. Vancouver to Portland is actually a pretty densely settled corridor. And then down the Williamette River Valley, which is pretty fertile. Uh, if you're going to cross from coast to coast, well, the plane, sure, you have the irritation of getting yourself to the airport and then spending time going through security and checking in and all that stuff and then waiting for the plane, and then waiting for the plane to actually take off, and after you land, waiting to get to a gate, and then waiting to pick up your luggage, if applicable, if you have check luggage, uh, and then transporting yourself to wherever you're going. But, for particularly long journeys, yeah, planes have the advantage. So, transcontinental high-speed rail, well, you can only really do that in places like the Chinese and Indian subcontinents and, well, Western Europe. Well, wait a second. What about people stopping in between?
Well, it's really hard to make an intermediate stop in an airliner compared to a train. So a lot of the business you get from high-speed rail actually is not end-to-end. -end. Almost all of it is going to be part of the way. So this is an example of different cultures and different societies having different needs and, well, situations that dictate those needs and wants that render the question of, say, high-speed rail into a question of should instead of could. Could we build high-speed rail in the United States or in Canada? Yes. Could we build high-speed rail economically in the United States or Canada? Well, if we had politicians who could actually see past their own limited terms, um, maybe. Because high-speed rail does stimulate growth of communities along it. For example, Dallas. Uh, people have cited Dallas, Texas as a case of, we built a railway station. And then the city just kept growing from there. So the con transcontinental railways, they did spur the growth of urban areas in the American Midwest, as they call it. And, well, they also did the same in the Canadian prairies. Whether high-speed rail would do the same thing, oh, well, who knows? There would be many positive externalities. However, since airliners are already convenient enough and car culture is pretty prevalent in the U.S. and therefore also in Canada, should we build high-speed rail in North America? Oh, no, not really. I mean, it's not economical at this time, as far as we can determine. All right, so that is a matter of transportation and logistics wins, like everything. Logistics win wars. It's said that amateurs talk about tactics while professionals study logistics. Uh, no, how about we change that up a little? More like noobs talk skill, amateurs talk tactics, students talk strategy, professionals talk logistics. So, uh, if we're going to come back to biology, like say DNA sequencing, well, we can do this. We can find if somebody has genes that predispose them to various genetic conditions. But should we? Well, that is considered debatable in some places, uh, especially since eugenics, i.e. selective breeding of humans, is considered rather unethical. For example, it's considered of dubious ethics to find out if somebody has Huntington's disease or the potential to develop Huntington's disease. Well, well actually if they have it, it's usually pretty obvious. Uh, but the potential to develop it, uh, that can be discovered by genetic sequencing and well, should insurance companies be allowed to charge this person higher premiums? Mm. And that's considered kind of debatable, but if it's, say, they're buying life insurance when they're 40, knowing that they're going to develop this condition and not informing the insurance company, is that them sc scamming the company? Huh, scamming insurance companies. Whoa. Well, okay, first of all, that's not a new idea, but usually what I hear about is more like insurance companies scamming us. Hmm. Well, uh, and then there's people who say are predisposed to atherosclerosis, so hardening of the blood vessels due to fat and cholesterol deposition along the walls. Should they be charged higher premiums for health insurance? just because they have this genetic predisposition. I mean, they didn't exactly choose to be born with it. Is it their fault? No. But 
Should they have to pay more for insurance because they have this? Well, economically speaking, the insurance company would be reasonable to demand, hey, if you're making us, the insurance company, take on higher risks of having to compensate you, well, by all means, you should pay us more for our service. Because, come on, insurance companies and their employees got to eat, too. Hmm. But then there's the, is it considered just and righteous to charge these people more? Problem. Well, uh, you'd end up with rather different answers for such a question from a student of economics versus a student of the humanities. So diverse viewpoints in science are very useful. Many of the greatest innovations originated in settlements that are along major trade routes. This is due to mixing of ideas and recombination into new ideas, according to the current dominant narrative. Uh, another view on the idea is that if you have many merchants competing, and perhaps whole civilizations competing against each other in the market, this forces them to try to get ahead of each other, and that makes them need to innovate need to invent new things to get the advantage okay that's one reason makes sense uh, what else well as settlements grow bigger what is a city fundamentally a city is a whole bunch of people who are not spending their entire days scrabbling about in the mud trying to feed themselves and their families so they are not subsistence farmers who are just barely surviving and making a living off the land. So a settlement uh, that is not, say, just a village of farmers, when they have more and more services due to growing wealth accumulating in the region, there are a lot more people who have the time, energy, and capital because inventing things is expensive. Protecting your inventions is also expensive, especially in the pre-modern times when there were no real patents. So uh, people who have the time, energy, and capital to make inventions or discoveries, they were few and far in between. It, it, well, okay, they are even now, to, even today, there aren't that many researchers per person. Now, on a more material view, instead of looking at the people involved, if you have the flow of ideas and technologies, hey, different local conditions require different adaptations, and this is important for creating new innovations. For example, the English longbow was created because compound bows and their glues did not fare well in the relatively wet conditions of England. What else? Well, the Chinese invented movable type rather earlier than Johann Gutenberg. So the Chinese invented no later than about 1040 Common Era. But Gutenberg took the paper and water-based ink that was transmitted along the Silk Road from China to Europe. Mass production of paper was very important. The Dark Ages are called that largely because of the fact that there were relatively few records from the time. Why? Well, they only had parchment to write on, which was really expensive. Parchment or vellum. They were really expensive, and therefore literacy was restricted to the rich. Now, after paper came around, literacy started spreading in Europe, and Gutenberg adapted the water-based ink to make oil-based ink and put this paper and his movable type together around 1450. Now block printing has seen separate independent inventions. This is convergent evolution or a case of convergent evolution that's seen technologically. The technologies have common ancestry far back in the form of mass-produced paper and ink, but in one case, 
they developed block printing in one particular fashion and in Gutenberg's case he developed it separately and the results were relatively similar in their products if not in their actual forms and well this is actually pretty common if you look at convergent evolution such as uh, Wolverines versus Tasmanian Devils they both have roughly similar body forms and they are both small aggressive predators uh, you can also compare this more well uh, directly in the case of legless lizards versus snakes how do we know they're legless lizards instead of snakes well they look like snakes they act like snakes but the genetics indicate and their physical structures sometimes uh, depending on how much you can actually find for evidence indicate that they're closer related to the local lizards than they are to the local snakes now diversity often comes down to a question of woman in science the first female professor of the sciences actually got a doctor of laws degree uh, this was way back in 1608 1608 yeah so this was actually pretty far back she was the first female lecturer who taught the sciences and also the first woman to get a university degree the Spanish playwright poet and novelist Lope de Vega says in a poem that she publicly taught all the sciences uh, by the way, uh, chemistry, physics, and biology didn't get split up from natural sciences for quite a while, even though people did specialize. From the professorial chairs and in schools, this tells us that no, the narrative that women weren't allowed to go to university for, well, until very recently is... Hmm, you mean they weren't going on mass like in huge numbers well certainly there were many restrictions and it wasn't until recently in historical time as in sometime in the 1800s that most universities were open to women uh, and women do remain re underrepresented in the higher levels of the biological sciences for now but over half of undergraduate and graduate biology students nowadays are women. So in other words, the pendulum is swinging. Uh, and if these graduate biology students have the same rate between men and women of proceeding to become professors, soon we will see that men will be underrepresented in the higher levels of the profession. Many ethnic groups are also seen as underrepresented. Now, there's a problem, guys, here. Because these ethnic groups are seen as underrepresented, we take measures to encourage them to uh, come in. Okay, th that's great. The means of encouragement, however, you know, the Chinese have the principle of chabudo, i.e. about right, like good enough. Yeah, that's after they put in the, a maximal effort and then the results they can shrug at. However, if you set out with that sort of attitude, usually the results are not so great. Which means that affirmative action, first of all, it's kind of insulting to a lot of its beneficiaries. Like, is it, am I here because I happen to tick your box? Or am I here based on, oh yeah, I'm good. Well, besides the insult, there's also the, if you make people who are not favored by affirmative action, uh, if you make us believe that the only way we can get anywhere is to be the very best like no one ever was 
Uh, quite frankly, the results, well, first of all, some of the kids are going to crack. Uh, the rest, the ones that do buckle down and go for it, uh, oh, you can check the average income by ethnicity stats for yourself. <clears throat> So it's claimed that the lack of diversity due to lack of various ethnic groups all being represented proportionately at higher levels of various professions it hinders the progress of science and that if you have more voices at the table you have more robust, valuable and productive exchanges. Anybody who's ever seen a large group of people sing along can tell you that if everybody is thinking the same thing and expressing the same things, this is not true. You have an echo chamber where everybody is yelling the same thing. You know what else we call an echo chamber? An indoctrination center. So, diversity will result in more voices, but we have to make sure that there is actually cultural diversity and actually diverse viewpoints so that they will say different things or pay attention to different things. Otherwise, well, all you get is like a thousand people yelling the same thing. You might as well just have one guy with a megaphone. Or one female or one other with a mic megaphone. Well, it, unless you really like the different tonal inflections of a thousand people saying the same thing in different ways. Mm. But uh, unless you're doing acoustics, I don't think that's what you're exactly looking for in science for the most part. <clears throat> anyway, if they're culturally uniform, you only have individual variation, which means that the groups that we're using today to categorize diversity are pretty pointless. Uh, you also have cultural clashes between groups if you have too much diversity, such as, well, trying to put creationists and evolutionary biologists on a project that requires evolution to work is a bit of a, uh, huh, what are you thinking? Well, okay, first of all, yeah, it, it'll have interesting results, but I'm pretty sure you're not trying to bog down or, wait, are we sure we aren't sabotaging these particular guys who are forced to work together by, I don't know, getting them into trouble or slowing them down or something? <laughs> yeah, no, just please... Sure, having di actually diverse viewpoints is great, but you actually have to have cultural diversity. Otherwise, you just have a whole bunch of people yelling the same thing, which is uh, an echo chamber. Okay, here, let's consider a core issue of this section and one you might have to consider in the future. The diversity problem is too politically charged for us to review here. So compare science versus technology. Well, science is a theory and we have discoveries, i.e. we realize things that we didn't know of before or weren't aware of before. Uh, and what else? Well, science we also use it as a means to understand. So, a method. Method of understanding. Or creating the best interpretation we can. Interpreting. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is, of course, very much affected by ideologies, beliefs, whatever, culture, etc., of the people doing the research. They will come to different conclusions if they have different beliefs. 
Now technology, well, that's a matter of application, and we make inventions. So inventions. Technology is affected by, yeah, of course, it's also affected by culture because culture affects needs and wants. Yeah, it's affected by the situation that your inventions are expected to be used in. And often it comes down to a matter of should we apply this instead of could we apply this. Such as the example of high-speed rail that I used earlier, or genetic sequencing. And there are innumerable other examples that we will discuss rather later. So, that's it for this section. Now, that's also it for this chapter. So, see you next section and chapter when we actually get into uh, some of the stuff that you might be more familiar with as biology. Instead of the, hey, what's science? Why do we do science stuff? Well, see you then. <laughs>